Glenn, G-L-E-N-N, F, middle initial, Chestnut, C-H-E-S-N-U-T, no T in the middle. My ancestors were too poor to afford the extra letter. <laughs> <laughs> Humble origins, yes. Yeah. Oh, did I goof up? Speaking of origins. Mm-hmm. How long? Two, three minutes. You can go longer if you want. Yeah, I, okay, let me let me see what I can do in two or three minutes. My real professional field was um, ancient Greek and Roman history and uh, Christianity and the early Roman Empire. So I come at this from a kind of odd angle. The first time I picked up the big book and read it, what struck me over and over as I read it was, this is St. Augustine. The notion that, that, that we have to stop trying to be perfect, but even bigger things like, it makes me want to be God. The great scholar Ernest Kurtz titles his book on early AA history, Not God. The first uh, piece of wisdom you need to learn about life, AA tells you is, you're not God. And this pride uh, comes in the form of what Augustine called the libido dominandi, the lust to control other people. So right after the big book lays out the 12 steps, it launches into a section where it says with Shakespeare, all the world's a stage, and I, thought that I should be the stage director and tell everybody else how to act their parts in the drama. I, I thirst for what Augustine calls the Gloria Mundi, the glory of the world. I want to be uh, the center of praise and attention. I want to be better than everybody else. Or if you look at the uh, histories of a lot of alcoholics, they then tried to do it by being terminally disruptive to everything they got involved in. But the most powerful way of all, Augustine says this at the end of his Confessions, we think that all sensible people would want to know the truth, don't we? And yet we don't. And the reason why is because I would have to admit that I was wrong. Nothing's going to work unless I'm willing to swallow my pride and admit that for 20 years or 30 years or so forth, I tried living my life by principles that were wrong and didn't work and left me absolutely miserable and are destroying my life. The Oxford Group was started by a man named Frank Buchman, who was a Lutheran pastor from Pennsylvania, who was in charge of a boys' home there. The board started cutting down the funds that they were giving him. He felt the boys weren't getting enough food to eat. And he got angry and quit and stalked off in a rage. He came to England. While he was there, he went to a service when Buchman says he felt something like an earthquake going on inside him. He sat there stupefied. And he realized that he had to do something about all this anger and resentment that was festering inside him, and it was destroying his life. He realized that he had to put away all of, any kind of resentment that he had against anybody. It worked very powerfully, and it worked so powerfully that a couple of the Anglican uh, bishops convinced him to go to Cambridge University, where he was to, in effect, treat the university students as unwashed pagans. And then he moved down to Oxford University, and he soon had a very large following. This was what the Oxford group arose out of. We see nations free on the march. The Oxford group tended to attract people who came from wealthy and powerful backgrounds. That's one of the things that makes it especially interesting. The hobnobbing with bishops, army generals, ambassadors. It was, a, it was an elite movement. But they nevertheless insisted that what they were trying to practice was, as they called it, first century Christianity. You believe very strongly in divine guidance. You would have a group of Oxford group people who would sit around and each one of them would have um, a notebook and a pen or a pencil. Each person would write down on the paper any kind of thoughts that appeared in their minds. There were some people who complained that when Frank Buchman was closely involved and the kind of guidance that was coming out on people's pads of paper didn't match with what Frank wanted them to do, that Frank would uh, insist that they go back and pray for a few more minutes and see if they couldn't come out with something on their pads of paper that matched more with what he wanted. 
They also believed in what was called checking. If an individual was not paying serious enough attention to some of their character defects and faults, they considered it the responsibility of the other members of the group to uh, brace that person and start explaining to them exactly what it was that they, they thought they were, they were doing wrong. This was one of the things that did not transfer well to AA later on, where alcoholics tended to uh, have tempers that were a little bit too fierce to put up with people checking them very much. But it seemed to work very, very well in the Oxford group. Because Frank Buchmann wasn't just a Lutheran, he was a Lutheran pietist. He instead put his emphasis upon things about the spiritual life that we have to apprehend at the level of intuition. But you did that best in these small groups that met in people's houses. You see this coming up very much in, uh, in, in early AA. The early AA meetings were, were usually in people's houses. Uh, this, this is a part of uh, Frank Buchmann's Lutheran pietism and the uh, early Oxford group that AA, I think, has, has preserved extraordinarily well and is one of the things that helps to give it its, its power uh, right after the 9-11 uh, catastrophe. Um, a lot of people are not aware of this. But a small AA meeting is set up right there at the uh, disaster site because you see some of the people who are going to help are AA, are AA members. And this is the place where they can go when it's um, the power of the thing is really starting to overwhelm them. Uh, so in this way, uh, AA can kind of sneak in any place and, um, and help the people that really need to be helped. It's, it's a very powerful tool that they have. The Oxford group, in a peculiar fashion, seemed to have sometimes okay short-term success with alcoholics, but sometimes not even that. We get some uh, AAs who are romantics who want to go back to the Oxford group days, but if you stop and think about it, Dr. Bob never did get sober in the Oxford group. He just kept on drinking. Bill Wilson got sober in the Oxford group, but was hanging on by the skin of his teeth for the next six months until he met Dr. Bob. And you could get two alcoholics working together. The Oxford group wasn't really a good solution for alcoholism in particular. It wasn't good if you wanted to keep people sober for longer than two or three years. The Oxford group, to make it easier for people to understand the program, liked to come out with lists, like the five C's. And another one that showed up over and over again are what they call the four absolutes. The goal, they said, of the kind of life we're trying to teach is absolute love, absolute honesty, absolute unselfishness. Let's try that one again. Absolute purity. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, that's, I think there's, I got a little bit of a subconscious blockage coming up sure, on that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> I try to avoid talking. Oh, geez. This, um, I think that one of the main reasons for Bill Wilson's objection to this, it was going to cause problems later on in AA and still to this day. No alcoholic did well if he was required to do anything that, that involved absolutes. If you try to come up with hundreds of rules, or even four rules, and think that if I can obey them perfectly, I will feel good about myself and God will love me, you inevitably find that you can't follow them perfectly. And um, you, you turn either into a hypocrite where you go around pretending that you're following them perfectly, or you end up falling into severe depression. Depression and despair. One difference between uh, AA and the Oxford group was that AA felt that it was better to soft pedal the issue of doctrine and dogma. The history of Western spirituality, some of the wisest people have had to step in from time to time and speak out against legalism and perfectionism. Uh, Augustine, the great African saint, drove himself crazy trying to be perfect and ended up having to acknowledge we have to learn to live with our imperfections. As a result, the big book bends over backwards to avoid setting down, out any kind of doctrines and dogmas and rules. So it, it simply says, we tried, to, we, we found God as we understood him. And it doesn't give any theological set of doctrines. You don't have to believe in a trinity. Uh, you don't have to believe in this theory or that theory. Uh, we, we don't even want you to think in terms of rules at all. And then we want you to go inside yourself and see what it is within you that's going wrong that is filling you with all of that anger and rage and resentment and fear and worry and anxiety and guilt. What you have to do is work out how you can live with yourself. 
the only kind of spirituality that's going to make sense to me is a spirituality that makes sense to me. And as long as I'm trying to buy somebody else's picture of God, it's never going to fit in with what I need. Uh, and though it may be traumatic to uh, have somebody tell you, no, we aren't going to tell you what to believe about God, you've got to work that out for yourself. It works a heck of a lot better in the long run. Uh, and, and so this is what AA stresses, a God who makes sense to me, even if this God seems strange to you. No one can stop drinking, no one can stop drugging, uh, no one can stop the, uh, the gambling and so forth and, and until we learn how to live with ourselves in our own minds where I can stand the thoughts going on in my own mind and I don't have to use chemicals or other things to try to mask what it is that I'm thinking. One of the things I think that AA has done better than any other spiritual movement in the 20th century is to deal with the impact of 20th century science. We're still so close to it, I think most of us don't realize how sweeping the changes were that occurred in human thought. At the beginning of the century, we had Albert Einstein introducing the theory of relativity. Uh, we had Bohr coming up with the uh, bottom theory and the way this applied to the atom. Uh, Schrodinger showing that electrons weren't just particles, they were also waves. And it was an absolutely sweeping change. The only other era in human history that I know where you had sweeping changes of that kind of magnitude was back at the time of the classical Greeks. The 20th century changes, I think, are going to prove to have been equally sweeping. Um, AA is, is born right in the midst of that, and the people that were involved knew that they had to make sense out of the world of modern science, the world of modern physics, the world of modern psychology, if they were going to stay sober. And so they, uh, they created a system that fits in with this modern worldview you don't have to do any special explaining. Uh, they, they automat they, it, it, it fits in smoothly and automatically. I think it's one of the most powerful things that the 12-step movement accomplished. Part of this was the new psychology as well. We talk a lot today about psychotherapy. This is really a, a Greek word, suchase therapia. It means the healing of souls. And for 2,000 years in the Western tradition, this was considered the prerogative of the clergy. It wasn't until the, the very end of the 19th century uh, that we had Sigmund Freud trying to get medical doctors into the healing of souls and coming up with his own kind of psychiatric theories. One of the things that AA had to do was to reclaim that territory for, for, uh, for a spiritual program and to say that, um, at least as far as they were concerned, you could not carry out good psychotherapy if you did not bring in spiritual issues dealing with their spiritual state as well as their psychological state. We're not talking about massive psychosis. But, uh, but no, they, they were saying that an awful lot of what goes on in psychotherapy works a whole lot better if you can give a spiritual basis to it. In AA, they talk a lot about the power of grace, the power from God that enables us to do these things that we cannot do under our own willpower that gives us a kind of power from outside. St. Augustine that I've mentioned before, that's absolutely crucial to his theory uh, of, of how uh, we can heal human lives. EA puts a, a strong emphasis on that. When people first come into Alcoholics Anonymous, if you have them tell the story of their lives and they tell it honestly, it will be a sad story, usually with all sorts of childhood traumas, and the story just keeps getting worse. And they start drinking, and they start getting in more and more trouble, and it gets worse and worse. And it's a story that you can tell absolutely is going to have a, an unhappy ending. Then something happens in the AA context, and you come back a year, two years, three years later, and it's turned into a story with a happy ending. At some point in there, in the storyline, the traumas in the past are still there, uh, the drunken escapades are still there, but at some point, the, st the story suddenly goes in a totally uh, a, a direction you would never have predicted. There's a kind of mysterious X factor in there. What we mean by grace is this mysterious X factor. Um, where is it coming from? In an AA context? As St. Augustine explained back in the uh, 5th century, an awful lot of God's grace is mediated to us through other people. People come into a 12-step meeting, they discover to their surprise a group of people who accepted them as they were, who wouldn't scold them or nag at them and just gave them pure love. And some of it is that simple. You see, grace is mysterious. How does it work? Nobody knows how it works. Sometimes it comes in especially 
odd and spooky kinds of ways. There's one man in my area who, um, whose drinking was getting worse and worse, who had his suicide all worked out. His wife had left him. He had everything on the dining room table, his will, uh, the insurance papers. He's so distraught by that point, he was going to drown himself by jumping in the Mississippi River in front of a barge uh, that afternoon. And one of the guys he regarded as his worst enemy there at the office, another vice president, says, would you go to lunch with me? I got something I need to talk with you about. He goes to lunch with the, the guy. He orders his, new, his usual two glasses of gin. And he takes a couple of sips, and the other guy says, I've, I've joined this AA thing, and it's time to do my eighth and ninth step, and I've got a lot of amends to make with you. This guy says, he listed all the things I knew about and other things I hadn't even known the guy had done to me. And he said, I couldn't drink any more of the gin, and the next thing you know, I'm in an AA meeting. Grace comes in surprising ways. It takes people by surprise. It comes at them from the side. It comes at them from a direction they don't expect. But when you talk to people in any of the 12-step programs and you ask them, how did you stay sober or clean of drugs or whatever, uh, the, the answer will, will be the same. It wasn't anything I did, and it wasn't my willpower, and it wasn't my wisdom. As long as I was following my own ideas, uh, I was destroying myself. It was some sort of grace that came from the outside. It's the most powerful thing of all in the AA program that really makes it work. The ancient Greeks had three different words for love, which is handy, because you can make distinctions you can't make in English. Eros, philia, and agape mean lust, like, and love. But agape love is the one that is uh, uh, really what AA is talking about more than anything else when they're talking about love. It, it's, not a, it's not an emotion. It's not hormones running through our system either. The best way of explaining what agape love means is, if I'm in real trouble on something and I'm feeling desperate, who is the person that I would go to where I would know that that person wouldn't totally condemn me, would still care what happened to me, and not only that, but would, if that person could, do something concrete to help me. It's a way of treating other people. There are a series of things that we do when we treat other people with genuine love which doesn't mean liking them and liking what they're doing. Bill Wilson talks about it uh, over and over every time he talks. This is the spirit that we have to develop in terms of um, learning how to live in the, in, in the world. Oh, there's an old timer. I, I love him because he puts things so simply. He says, what is my program about? He says, do good, show love. Showing love is doing good to other people. Showing love is being of service to other people. Uh, showing love is being the kind of person where if I can help you, I will try to do it, and not just uh, and, and in concrete ways, not just in terms of uh, fancy words, which are easy, easy to say, uh, but to actually uh, go there and do something to help the other person, that takes work on my part.